If a cartoonishly evil mining corporation unleashed a scourge of killer marine life while trying to wipe out you and your friends, what would you do? Evidently, these guys didn't feel like waiting around for permits before they started tearing up the ocean floor, and they'll stop at nothing to avoid paying the associated fines, even if it means sacrificing their own men and countless innocent people to cover up their operation. Oh, yeah, there's also giant sharks and squids and stuff. It's crazy. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat bad writing in Meg 2. Jonas is a man of action. When he's not out living some Greenpeace wet dream exposing illegal dumping operations, he's gearing up to visit as yet unexplored depths of Earth's oceans, alongside his friends at the Oceanic Institute. And judging by their chairman's keynote address, this next voyage is going to be one for the books. Years of collecting tax-deductible donations from Exxon and BP have allowed these lunatics to finally fulfill their dream of breaking through the thermocline into an unexplored ocean trench using a pair of experimental submarines. Not sure why they wouldn't send a drone down first, given they had enough funding to make two of these. And a rescue sub. But apparently, they're not all that worried about it. Guess we'll just have to hope for our hero's sake they don't blow up in the headlines like those other guys a while back. At any rate, the expedition seems to kick off without a hitch. Just as they're about to cross the threshold, Mission Control points out Jonas's sub is using up oxygen at a greater than normal rate. Much to their surprise, however, this isn't the result of a malfunction, at least not a mechanical one. Before you start yelling, can I just say, I did all kinds of stupid things when I was 14. Oh really? Like sneaking aboard a relatively untested submersible bound for some of the deepest parts of the ocean, thereby raising the rate of O2 consumption by more than 30%? Because I honestly can't think of anything that even comes close from when I was that age. But whether it's the result of higher than normal carbon dioxide levels or mere laziness, it seems the presence of an additional mouth breather isn't enough to immediately call off the dive. I mean, I mean, it's probably fine, right? After all, what are the chances they might find themselves trapped at the bottom of the sea with a rapidly dwindling air supply? And just in case things weren't crazy enough already, it turns out there's yet another uninvited guest on this unalive mission in the form of wacky uncle Zhuming's pet megalodon, Aichi. Yes, you 100% heard that correctly. Evidently, the people that built her giant saltwater fish tank thought it appropriate to include one giant shark-sized vent leading out into the open ocean instead of a bunch of smaller shark-sized vents. I'm not an engineer, but you know, that just seems like a really bad idea. Fortunately for everyone involved, the prehistoric monster was trained not to attack humans, so they're not actually in any real danger. Oh, wait, never mind. It's a fuck shark. Realizing this, the dive team decides their only chance is to breach the thermocline ahead of the schedule. And pray to God, there aren't like 10 more of these things waiting on the other side. And what do you know? There totally are. It's a good thing all the magic anti-predator countermeasures charged up just in time. Or we might have to wait two weeks to find out what the Navy knew on day one. Oxygen reserves are at maximum. Predator countermeasures are deployed. Right now, we are perfectly safe. Bro, there is no such thing as perfectly safe when you're more than 20,000 feet below the surface. I, I hope you understand that. Apparently not, because Zhu Ming's first instinct upon seeing a school of comically oversized killing machines swimming off into the unknown is to follow them, which ultimately results in both subs exiting the mission area to explore an unmapped portion of the trench. And by explore, I mean stare at the inky blackness of the abyss, because it turns out it's really fu- dark down there. Who would have thought? The best part is, they can't even use their high beams out of fear it might attract the megs. So, this is as good as it gets until they exit the thermocline. Again, it really makes you wonder why they wouldn't just send some robot down with underwater cameras to do this. Then, they could light the place up like Times Square. And if the thing gets munched, who cares? Still, despite barely being able to see the ground right in front of them, the dive team randomly stumbles upon some kind of sea lab anchored to the ocean floor. That's not all. Sonar reveals another tub putting around right above them, prompting them to take a closer look. Meanwhile, aboard the unknown sub, we find evildoer Montes supervising the installation of mining charges on a nearby ridge. And just to really drive home the fact that he's the bad guy, the first thing Mustache does upon recognizing the approaching vessels is needlessly TK his entire outfit by prematurely detonating the explosives. What was that? Landslide! Jamaica! 
Well, at least he stopped those meddling tree huggers from doing what exactly? No, for real. What did Monty's think would happen if these guys got any closer to him? It was way too dark for anyone to see the charges, and nothing about either the underwater lab or the submarine suggests they were involved in some kind of illegal mining operation. You know, unless they were dumb enough to slap a bunch of evil corp decals all over the place or something. As far as anyone would be able to tell, they're just another group of deep sea explorers with better funding. Maybe they're a foreign government testing out classified equipment. Who knows? All this absurd knee-jerk reaction is likely to accomplish is launch an inquiry into the dive team's disappearance, thereby bringing even more attention to their last known location. Couple that with Jonas's minor celebrity status for his special Meg hunting powers, and the whole world will be dying to know what went wrong. Besides, does he really think that the Oceanic Institute will just throw up their hands and be all like, well, I guess they're dead? No, they're obviously gonna send more subs, or preferably drones, to try and find the wreckage. Suffice it to say, had Monty's done literally nothing, Jonas, Zhuming, and the rest of the crew would almost certainly have wrapped up their little pleasure crew scratching their heads over what they just saw. At that point, if he's still worried about them figuring it out, he can have someone blow them up on dry land where people won't ask any questions. However, by some miracle, we come to find out everyone on board both vessels managed to survive the attack, only to immediately realize just how utterly screwed they are. The subs are completely fu- O2 supplies are draining fast, and the heating systems are offline, but at least they still have comms with the surface, right? Yeah, about that. It turns out their one rescue sub was mysteriously sabotaged beyond repair, meaning there's pretty much nothing anyone topside can do to help them, besides offering words of encouragement. Still, as hosed as they might seem, there is one last hope for Team Jonas to make it out alive. I'm gonna walk. I'm gonna walk back across the trench and make it into that seafloor station. Right. Then we can come called AAA. Okay, it's actually not quite as ridiculous as I'm making it sound. Every one of the crew members has their own magic underwater exosuit thing that can somehow withstand more than 11,000 pounds per square inch of pressure they'll be facing at the bottom of the trench. Even Mi Ying had the foresight to pack her own before making herself a massive liability. Now, all they have to do is make the nearly two mile death march through unknown terrain before their two hours of oxygen runs out. Oh, yeah, and then there's the fact that whoever lives in that thing is probably not super friendly. Just think about what happened leading up to this situation. We saw the station, then we saw a submarine, and then the entire world exploded. Clearly, they were trying to kill us. So what do you think they're gonna do when we roll up to the airlock looking for help? It doesn't do us much good now, but I can't help but think the Mana 1 team should have taken advantage of these super suits to devise some kind of last-ditch emergency flotation device we could use to reach the surface in the event the rescue sub couldn't make it down in time. The fact the suits were designed to maintain sea level internal pressure means there wouldn't be a risk of getting the bends, and two hours would be more than enough time to make it back to the surface. Naturally, this would require us to pass through the thermocline, but if we're gonna die anyway, we might as well take that chance, and in this case, the explosion ripped a giant hole right through it. Can't wait to see what kind of effect that's gonna have later on. Of course, there's also the risk of running into hungry sea life along the way. This is the Meg franchise after all, but as our heroes are about to find out, walking along the ocean floor isn't exactly any safer. Glenn? No, we... We can't just leave him out there. Uh, did you not see that helmet float down? Dude just snapped into a Slim Jim. There is nothing left of him to save. And the same will go for everyone else if we don't shut up and get a move on. Fancy spear guns or not, the ocean is not our domain. And until we invent a belt-fed version of the Russian APS, it's gonna stay that way. Luckily, Zhu Ming gets the bright idea to drive the critters off with a flare before anyone else gets uncorked. But this saving grace comes at a cost of calling in a megalodon Don feeding frenzy. Not sure why it took him so long to realize he needed to drop the dinner bell immediately, but either way, it seems the apex predators are here to stay. That being said, we're not entirely helpless. Sure, the Megs are, well, Megs, but beyond their massive size, they really aren't all that different from a regular shark. In that case, we should use our spear guns to target their eyes, snouts, and gills in hopes the shock of being attacked will convince them to find an easier meal. There's no guarantee 
guaranteed it'll have any effect at all. But what exactly is the alternative? I mean, it's not like we'd actually be able to outrun them down here. Wait, never mind. I forget. These dive suits were made out of 100% pure plutonium, giving our heroes the much needed speed boost to reach the airlock in one piece. Well, almost. One of the strong female submariners did wind up getting mega munched in the process. And then there's Curtis. It's gonna implode. It's gonna be Wow, that sucks. There's literally nothing she could have done about it either. And while everyone else makes it to safety, I gotta wonder why they'd be ditching their dive suits all of a sudden. Sure, there's breathable air in here, for now, but we'd have no way of knowing what kind of condition this place might be in following the explosion. Not to mention the possibility of running into the same hostile crew members that nearly sunk our battleship a minute ago. I mean, for Christ's sake, Zhuming used one to smash through solid concrete earlier. Anyone gets in our way down here, and we could tear them in half like a phone book. Sadly, it seems that won't be necessary, as a brief investigation turns up no sign of anyone else on board. What they do find, however, is a terminal they can use to re-establish communications with mission control, as well as a map showing a pair of escape pods. But just as they're about to float off into the sunset, their friend and mission controller, Jess, remotely jettisons one of the pods and traps them inside the station. In the ensuing bad guy dialogue, it is revealed she's been working for Evil Corp this entire time. And if they don't agree to join the dark side, she'll launch the last remaining pod and condemn them all to a watery grave. So, yeah, let's just tell her we're all about it so we can get out of here. No, for real, how exactly could she stop us from backing out the second we made it up to the surface? I mean, I guess she could have her henchmen pull guns on us or something, but I'd still much rather take my chances with them than swimming up 25,000 feet on a breath hold. Besides, Zhu Ming said a single briefcase full of the ore they're mining is worth like a billion dollars. Do you know how much ocean plastic you could clean up with a billion dollars? Who cares? We're rich now. I say, take the deal. But of course, you know Jonas is just so chocked full of integrity, he can't even bear the thought of lying to the bad guys for all of like five minutes. And guess what happens next? Not only does Jess launch the last remaining escape pod, she also starts filling the room with water just to help drive home what a horrible decision they made. All I can say is that it's a good thing we left those impregnable dive suits back at the airlock where they're completely useless. I mean, for all we know, their combined power would have been enough to force the door open and help get us out of this death trap, but I guess we'll never find out. Now, I'll admit, things are looking pretty bad right now, but we're not hosed yet. I mean, realistically, yes, we'd be totally f- but as long as one of us is being played by Jason Statham, we will always have a chance. The plan is to send him out through the still functional escape pod airlock so he can swim back around to the main entrance and open the door from the other side. Of course, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, that sounds totally insane. And you'd be right. After all, they are 25,000 feet below the surface. The pressure alone should wring him out like a kitchen sponge, right? It doesn't work like that. You don't see fish wearing metal suits, do you? No. But you aren't exactly seeing trout down here, are ya? There are absolutely creatures like the snailfish that have adapted to survive at these depths, but they are by no means your average fish. I mean, for starters, they have gaps in their skulls allowing them to flex under the immense pressure without being crushed. Jonas, not so much. And as for the rest of their bones, well, they're hardly even bones at all. So yes, Regus is right in that he won't immediately get squeezed into salami sauce like with what happened to Curtis, because that kind of implosion only occurs during a sudden extreme change in pressure. But simply filling his sinuses with water to keep them from compressing isn't gonna do much once his entire chest caves in. However, let's just say for funsies that he somehow managed to survive having both lungs violently collapse. He's still gonna have to swim an indeterminate distance through the freezing sea on a zero breath hold while also avoiding the dangerous predators lying in wait to devour anything that moves. Man, if only there were some kind of protective outer layer he could have worn that would not only resist the crushing pressure of the entire ocean and provide a limited reservoir of breathable oxygen, but also endow him with inhuman strength he could use to ward off hostile sea life. Pfft, absent something like that, it'd probably be a better use of our extremely limited manpower to have as many people as possible searching for some sort of manual override we can 
used to open the door. I mean, you'd think that they would incorporate at least some redundancy into this thing in case the power went out, right? Well, maybe not. Either way, it doesn't matter because we all know Jonas is totally going to clutch this. He even manages to one-tap one of the crocosaurs to show Mother Nature who's boss. But just when it looks like he's about to completely breeze through this ordeal, old Monty shows up to mildly inconvenience him. There's a million scumbags in this world. So they keep track of all of them. Pretty sure that's what Twitter's for. Still, I gotta say, it sure was nice of the evil bad guy not to simply slit his throat while Jonas was still getting off the floor. I guess that's why he ultimately chose not to finish Monty's off after kicking him onto a pile of rocks. With the rest of the dive team rescued, the gang steals Monty's sub and makes for the surface. Only to find the Model 1 platform has been taken over by a bunch of really stupid mercenaries. You'll see what I mean here in a minute. Anyway. The plan now is for Regis and Maying to go set up an escape raft, while Jonas and Zhuming try to rescue the only two people on this entire installation that they actually care about. As for the dozens of other souls on board who worked tirelessly to make their subnautical dreams a reality, you know, f them. Needless to say, the mysterious armed men prowling around the station are all hired guns working for Evil Corp. Don't let their gruff appearance in GWAT era M4s fool you. These guys are all completely completely useless. I mean, their call sign is literally cleanup crew, which implies they're here to eliminate any trace of what went down. This is further reinforced by the fact Jess tells them verbatim to dispose of any liabilities, which in my mind means waste anyone that isn't her and dump their bodies overboard. And yet, what do they do every time they see someone? Freeze! 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 Pro tip, people freeze real good after being shot in the face. Seriously, what the heck? is the point of all that? Are you gonna make them a pinky swear not to say anything like Jess did with Jonas earlier? Unless you're planning on chaining them to their desks for the rest of their lives, they're just gonna go to the authorities the second you let them go. That makes them liabilities. Now, dispose of them. And speaking of liabilities, Evil Corp could have easily avoided a major one by postponing their illegal mining activities until after the Dive 1 mission was over. Like, I get the team went off course and all that, but do you really think they wouldn't have noticed the massive underwater explosion ripping a hole through the thermocline. Fact is, Jess would have had to have known about the expedition far enough in advance to have the miners lay low for a day or two. Those priceless minerals have been sitting down there for millions of years. I'm pretty sure they aren't going anywhere. But alas, here we are. And because the cleanup crew is out there playing freeze tag for control of the station, DJ and Mac are able to escape certain death not once, but twice before ultimately being taken into custody, and you'll never guess what happens then. Oh, Don't shoot. oh, see, should've told them to freeze. Well, now that Team Jonas has acquired automatic weapons, we should probably focus on clearing the rest of Mono 1, and then using the mercenary's helicopter to GTFO, after feeding Jess feet first into the rotors, of course. It's either that, or paddling helplessly away at a breakneck speed of two miles an hour, while the bad guys plink us all to death from back at the station. I mean, just look at the raft. It's bright orange for Christ's sake. And did I mention the three bloodthirsty megalodons swimming around out there? Meanwhile, Jonas, Zhuming, Mac, Regus, and DJ all know this place like the back of their hands. And between the two carbines, sidearms, and DJ's deagle, there's more than enough firepower to get the job done. Plus, since the mercs are so dead set on taking people alive for some reason, we could have Ming bait them into an ambush by posing as a terrified crew member. Otherwise, I just have her hide under a bed somewhere while the rest of us ready or not this big. Instead, not only does the Dream Team leave the weapons behind, they don't even try to create some kind of distraction before shoving off, which naturally results in them getting spotted almost immediately. Because of course it would. Don't worry though, like I said before, the bad guys are dumb as hell is why they get in another boat to go after them as opposed to, you know, just shooting them. I'm honestly starting to doubt whether those guns even work at all. They're only a couple hundred yards away and barely moving. Anyone with even novice level rifle training would have no trouble shredding them before they paddled out of range. Oh, what's that? You've never fired a gun before in your life? Okay then, how about you take the helicopter, you know, the one you guys flew in on, and drop a 
refrigerator on them from 50 feet up. The best part is, if you miss, you could just go back and get another one and try again dozens of times before they got anywhere. But because the mercenaries forgot that their rifles are, in fact, rifles, and that their helicopter is, in fact, a helicopter, they decide to pursue using the most unstable shooting platform imaginable, all while their outboard motor is making a ton of noise. And you know what that means. Do your job, take the bloody shot. Was easy, it? Skill issue. At any rate, now that our heroes saw one of the three megalodons eat a single boat, they just blindly assume it's safe to fire up their own motor and make a break for the nearest land, which just so happens to be a place called Fun Island. As the name suggests, it's all one giant resort packed full of unsuspecting party people just asking to get eaten. And wouldn't you know it, the sound of their Mai Tai fueled merriment is enough to draw in every massive meat eater within 50 miles. Of course, knowing how popular this place is, I gotta wonder why Lady Evil Corp herself would come out and risk popping up on someone's camera roll. I mean, the whole point of hiring Black Ops mercenary commandos is to afford the company a degree of plausible deniability, something they've just completely picked away by putting the single most recognizable person in their organization right at the scene of the crime. Or at least they would have had she not gotten eaten by Varen almost immediately after landing. Probably should have kept the door closed. Either way, why would any one from Evil Corp even be out here in the first place. I understand they want to cover the situation up, but unless they're planning on rounding up every last tourist on this island and telling them to freeze, they're just linking themselves to the disaster. A better idea would have been to simply eliminate everyone at Mana 1, blow up the installation, and then shrug their shoulders when the world found out about the Fun Island Massacre. Fact is, only the Oceanic Institute was publicly known to be operating out there, so people would naturally assume they screwed something up that caused all this, and all the mercs would have to do to make this happen is track down the one bright orange boat full of escapees they watched speed away toward this island, something which we know they could have done because you can literally see their helicopters arriving before the raft even gets there. Seriously, it's like they aren't even trying to get away with this. As for our heroes, upon reaching the island, they immediately split up so that Jonas, Juming, and Mac can all throw their lives away fighting giant sharks that have no way of harming anyone on land. Now, don't get me wrong. Those things definitely gotta die, but there's nothing that says we want to deal with them immediately. Right now, the priority should be getting everyone out of the water and then finding a way to call for help. I mean, if anything, those dino croc monsters are way bigger issue since they can actually follow us onto dry land. Realistically, the Megs are a piece of cake. After all, humans have been killing sharks forever. It's honestly one of the things we're best at. All we have to do is fill some whale carcass with dynamite, wait for them to take the bait, and then tell them all to smile. That that's easily something we can address once this whole mess is over. But because killing Megs is all he knows, Jonas takes their improvised bomb lances and heroically sets out on the one remaining jet ski to handle business in the most reckless way imaginable. Okay, it does look pretty cool though, I'll give him that. However, before Jonas can cut the Megs down even further, Monty's rolls in out of nowhere to start making life difficult with the M249. Oh yeah, and if you're wondering how he survived, it's because he found one of the dive team's super suits and then rode some kind of inflatable buoy thing all the way up to the surface. What a crazy idea, right? Anyway, it seems Monty's is really pissed off about being left for dead at the bottom of the ocean, which is why he decided to settle things once and for all. Still, I gotta wonder why he'd come out here and risk getting eaten when he could simply wait at the shore and shoot Jonas in the head as soon as he gets back. Besides, look what the man is doing. For fuck's sake, dude's probably gonna wind up getting himself killed anyway. And if he can take one or two of the Megs out in the process, that's even better. Unfortunately for Monty's, he got his weapons training from the same culinary school as the rest of the henchmen, prompting him to get right on top of Jonas's last known position instead of waiting patiently for him to resurface from a safe distance away. It goes about how you'd expect. <laughs> See you later, chum. After a while, crocodile. No, wait, that's good enough. Elsewhere on the island, Zooming and Mac are currently screwing around in a helicopter trying to fend off a giant octopus with a fertilizer bomb. Now, if you're wondering how they acquired these items, it basically all ties back to the mercenaries being grossly incompetent. I won't waste your time with the whole freeze thing again, but rest assured, it's irredeemably cringeworthy how they managed to pull it off. Anyway, what's important is that they're here now and flying dangerously close to the sea monster's grasp, which predictably results
results in the chopper getting yoinked right out of the sky, and both men being plunged into the water. But just as Calamari is about to devour Zhuming and totally undermine this film's Chinese reception, Haichi rolls in out of nowhere to save her master's life. I guess all that time he spent training a stupid fish paid off after all. And since we know there were only three megs that made it through the thermocline, that means there's just one unfriendly leviathan left to harpoon. Of course, I would normally say this isn't that big a deal, and we can handle it later. But this time around, our good friend Mac is trapped in harm's way. And you just know Jonas would rather die than risk letting someone else kill one of the Megs. Now, if only we hadn't dumped Monty's saw in the water like it was completely useless. Sure, 556 wouldn't be my first choice in hunting prehistoric megafauna, but we could use the concussion from the muzzle blast to at the very least lure it away from our friends. Besides, if Karamojo Bell could drop an elephant with a single round of 7 mil, I'm sure an entire belt full of green tip would be more than a tickle for Big Bruce over here. Lucky for Jonas, there are other options available. <laughs> Ah, yes, the old Maasai lion hunting technique. Gets him every time. And with that, Jonas, Zhuming, Ming, Regus, DJ, and Mac, and probably some other people I'm forgetting, can finally put this whole mess behind them. After which, they will almost certainly continue doing dumb stuff at the bottom of the ocean. In the end, most of our heroes made it out alive, but we did end up losing a few down in the trench. Sadly, it seems their deaths may have been inevitable once the charges went off. That said, had Jonas put his pride aside for half a second and agreed to join up with Jess when she made him the offer. They could have worked together to eliminate the escape to sea creatures instead of wasting all that time grab at around the oil rig. This would have likely prevented massive loss of life at Fun Island, and once the situation was resolved, they could have easily stabbed Evil Corp in the back and exposed them for their crimes. For that reason, I think Meg 2 was beaten. Oh wait, I knew I was forgetting something. In case you were wondering what happened to Jess, she found out the hard way why you never turn your back on a shark. Also think Moral of the story, there's no such thing as safe underwater.